Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's a no time video. Yeah, hey, it's a fun <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, should we sing up? <laughs> All right, now we're ready. Too, so. Now we're ready. <laughs> oh, that's me. That's me. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Talking Twomps. We're all back together here on campus again, so Woo-hoo! we decided to well, gather up. almost on campus. Yeah, we're close. We're in the new exclusive hidden podcasting house. Come and find us. We don't live anything near the train station, anywhere near it. Um, today, we're going to be talking about languages, one topic that I know that all of us here are passionate about. We all, I think, aspire to or speak a second language, some of us three, Vince. Woo! Um, so, we're going to be talking about languages today, and I think we're first going to introduce the panel. Uh, my name is Ryan Walter. I will be your moderator for today, and I will work, uh, speak on some languages. And we're going to start with the man, the myth, the legend to my right. Joe. Is that me? <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Joe. Uh, I am now, I guess, a senior at the college. Time flies. Uh, and I am a speaker of Russian on the panel today. And not English. No, I don't speak any English at all. Just, he's just memorized that one phrase. Uh, my name is Jacob Cordes, and I will be talking about Spanish and about uh, fictional and constructed languages, because I have a book right here with me uh, on that topic. And my name is Blake, and I'm not too happy about the idea that Jacob has a book on hand. I don't know if any of you are regular listeners, but whenever Jacob is quoting from a book, uh, <laughs> there is often uh, mischief. Um, now, I quoted that from memory last time. Fair enough. I didn't uh, talk about the Robert book. Frost one? But, uh, <laughs> as I said, my name is Blake, I'm a senior here, and I'll be speaking on what is objectively the best language in existence, German. Shots fired, Jesus. <laughs> Hello, my name is Vincent. Uh, I am a junior in this college, and I will be speaking on the beautiful language of Indonesian and a little bit of Chinese as well. Not as great, I think. I am William Moore. I am a junior um, at the college, not legally speaking, but you know, whatever. Uh, thanks, William and Mary. And I will be addressing French and the mother of the Romance languages, Latin. I have Irish and Norwegian, by the way. That, that's, <laughs> that's what I did. Two ugly, ugly languages. Excuse me, Irish is beautiful. It's not the best. No, it's, it's really ugly when you hear it spoken. I think it's beautiful. Okay, uh, so in terms of topics, uh, or what we're talking about, in terms of questions about languages, um, I'm going to throw just a quick question out for all of you to answer. What is, uh, why is your language the one that you study the best one, if you think it is? Joe. <laughs> I um, I think that we started off on the wrong foot by talking about best languages, take, quote unquote. And go to something else. Uh, I will say that although it has a reputation for being sort of illogical and difficult, I think Russian and the Slavic languages in general uh, are sort of straightforward in a way that English, for example, is not. Uh, both in pronunciation and in rules. Uh, and it does have complexity, but I think that complexity allows a um, sort of deeper shades of understanding that is, uh, that is possible, I would say, in simpler languages, um, you know, such as English, not to offend the language as a whole. Um, you know, stuff that we would require sentences for, uh, you know, extra words in the sentence can be done in Russian and the Slavic languages with different cases, different endings, different, um, prefixes. Uh, and I think that's idiosyncratically lovely. What a word. Jacob, why do you like Spanish so much? Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to agree with Joe, first of all, that we shouldn't really be talking in terms of which language is best, because it, it, they're just... Okay, okay, know. but what should we talk about instead? <laughs> then, it's, just, it, it's just not... That's not how you evaluate language, right? But I personally love Spanish, um, because it is a language that has such a diversity of presentation um, in the world. I mean, there's everything from the very, uh, very distinctive Castilian accent that we all 
like to think of as a lisp, but really it's much more complicated than that. You know, love it or hate it, it's a very complicated, distinctive accent. And, and there are, you know, dozens of different um, linguistic dialects in the Americas alone, and, and, and a number of Creoles, you know, with uh, various other languages that just all have these beautiful methods of expression. And I think Spanish is, some, is a language that most people take at some point or another in middle school or high school. Otherwise, they're probably taking French. Um, but you can really dedicate your life to studying it and not learn all there is to know about it. See, that's perhaps, I think that is a, a beautiful case study of all the reasons for which I, I do not like German. Um, <laughs> that is not to say that I don't like German, it's just that there's no way in the English language to properly phrase that sentence. Um, however, there is in the German language. And uh, that's, I think, the beauty of German, that it is, it's so limited in its geographical use that the, the Germans and those who speak German have been able to very, very closely regulate the way that the language behaves uh, in the 1970s and then again in the 1990s, they actually overhauled their language, um, which went over swimmingly with basically everybody who used it. Um, and it fits together uh, with, with systematic simplicity that I cannot but applaud. Um, it, if you want to build those words that Joe was talking about that express things that take an entire sentence for English to express, um, you simply need two words that express the two parts of that, or three, or four, and you build them. Um, and sometimes there's a little bit of nuance in that, but oftentimes you don't need it, because the other thing is that a lot of times when you think of something being systematized, you think it loses nuance, but instead what they have done is brute forced nuance by adding every possible thought into the language as a separate word. I cannot express to you how many ways that there are to say the word um, uh, useful in German, but in several different nuanced ways, depending on whether or not it is functionally useful, emotionally useful. Uh, there's just, it's such, there's so many possibilities for combinations that it becomes a beautifully easy, um, uniformly pronounceable, and uh, extremely well regulated <coughs> language. Wow, that was a lot. All right. Um, so I think I'm in a uh, privileged position because the languages I represent, quote-unquote, are astronomically different than everyone else's here. Uh, Indonesian is Austronesian in nature, so it doesn't really follow a lot of the standard rules or uh, motifs that are found in the languages here. Uh, Chinese, of course, is even more unique because it is not an alphabet-based language. It's more, uh, it derives its roots from pictograms. It is also a tonal language. To some, it's very pretty, but to people who learn Chinese, people who are trying to pick it up again, it can be extremely difficult to talk about. Um, but on the uniqueness of these languages, I think Indonesian is uh, similar to German in its modularity. Uh, one, you could have one root word, and, def and depending on the prefixes or the suffixes, or the infixes, or even the, uh, what are those called? Circumfixes, like su suffixes and prefixes combined, you could derive so much meaning. I mean, you could have one root word, like uh, that w one that means pair, and depending on how you construct the word with prefixes or suffixes, you can, you can make it translate to to pair up to something, or to be a pair of, or to accidentally be in a pair things of that nature. And so I think perhaps it's more intuitive because you could just think of the language as using root words and then adding back and forth. Now, this is a motif seen in English, I guess, but not to that extent. You could have so much uh, variance in your lexicon with just one or two words. And, of course, with Chinese, like I think, like I said before, it's not an alphabet-based language. Um, <clears throat> So, for example, in English, if you don't really know what a word is, there are many hints that you can use to at least pronounce the word. Not so in, in Chinese, because if you don't know it, most likely you don't know it, and then there's that. Um, and so I think these are very uh, unique traits of the language. I wouldn't say they're great because of that. Especially Chinese, like, I'm sorry, but it's really hard to, to learn. As someone who's spoken it for quite a while, even I still don't like the language. 
because it is extremely difficult to learn. Like that's that's a problem. In, Indonesian is unique because it is one of the um, one of the <laughs> constructed Asiatic languages that that's uses correct. a romance or a, a Roman alphabet. Right. That's correct. Uh, I was going to get into that, but I thought we were going to have like a history section. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we'll do that later. And then, uh, William, you're up. Yeah. So I have two languages. I'm going to start with French. Um, so French is an interesting language because it is actually the it is a Romance language. So it is very much based in Old Vulgar Latin. So it draws a lot of its constructs from there. And in many ways, it simplifies them and that makes them very straightforward. Um, French is a much more direct language than English. In English, there tends to be a lot more passivity and things of that nature. In French, there is the passive voice. It's rarely used. Frenchmen are usually very direct, usually very straightforward when they address something. And you can actually kind of see that when Frenchmen are talking. It's just part of the way that the language influences thought. At least that's what I think. Uh, French also has a standardized way that it's technically supposed to be spoken. That was the Académie Française, which is supposed to regulate how French is spoken throughout the French-speaking world. It doesn't have any legal authority, though. Its opinions are well-respected, so there are different versions of French. There's the French of France, there's the French of Belgium, the French of uh, Switzerland, the French of um, Africa, um, etc., etc. And the different parts of Africa have different ways that they speak French in accordance with their local language. Um, what's very interesting about French is it's actually a growing language. It's actually scheduled, It currently has about 220 million speakers worldwide, but the UN expects it to actually grow to about 700 million speakers worldwide by 2050, mostly in Western Africa due to population growth and the fact that many of them speak languages, the language of government, etc., etc. Um, but see, if you teach a language to a country with one of the largest populations of the world, you just, in default, have Indonesian as one of the languages most spoken in the world, see? Well, I mean, so it's the same thing with Mandarin, you know? <laughs> so, I, mean, I think it's kind of interesting, though, that, you know, for instance, we think of English as being one of the largest languages in the world, in that it's used for international commerce, but there aren't that many countries outside of the U.S., England, Canada, and Australia that speak it as their first language, that the, what they use internally. Nigeria. Um, right. You know, in South Africa, <laughs> a, a couple of... Um, well, Botswana like, has Swana yeah. too. Yeah, but they all speak, they're all pretty much all fluent in both. They, uh, they speak English, they learn English growing up as their language, and then yeah, no. they speak Swana in... Well, so what I think is interesting Canada. is English, so a lot of people do speak English when they're speaking to other people, but it seems like French has been in the unique position in Western Africa of becoming the lingua franca, not only between countries, but you know, and obviously we know how that came about yes. violently and, you know, through a uh, long system of colonialism. But it's interesting that it's been adopted as a sort of native language um, for that region. Yep. And it's and it's definitely on the rise there. It's also got, French also has the distinction of that it's one of the two really diplomatic languages of the world, the other being English. Uh, many organizations have French as one of their two, like, most important languages. The UN Charter was originally also written in French. Um, many organizations are technically under French name. Uh, the big one that everybody loves to talk about is FIFA, the Fédération Internationale Football Association. Oh, I was going to say Médecins Sans Frontières. Yeah, Médecins Sans yeah. Frontières. Uh, that's another one. Uh, and so, uh, Peugeot. <laughs> yeah, and Peugeot, the ever-loved car company. company. Car, car company. company. It's a no. car company. They also <laughs> used to make furniture. It is like the, the history of Peugeot as a company is freaking makes no sense. But not the subject of this podcast. Not the subject of this podcast. Oh. Uh, now I'm going to follow that up with Latin, the original lingua franca, of which lingua franca is in Latin. Uh, Latin has an interesting history because it is now very much a historical language, but it has changed over time. Um, in the modern day, if you want to say there are two accents of Latin, if you will, there is classical or academic Latin, um, followed up with vulgar or ecclesiastical Latin. Um, and vulgar is not as in, like, it's very obscene, it's from the Vulgate, so... Could be, though. Keeping that in mind. Uh, Latin is a very inflective language, which means it has a metric <laughs> of cases, declensions, and all that stuff. Basically, to illustrate very subtle nuances between verbs that a Roman would 
absolutely understand and have kind of been lost to time. If you want the exact breakdown of it, it has three genders, seven noun cases, five declensions, four verb conjugations, four verb principal parts, six tenses, three persons, three modes, two voices, two aspects, and two numbers. Hold on, three genders, male, female, and neuter. 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 So that, that's one of the things that's actually been lost to many Romance languages. French, for instance, only has two genders. They just, well, yeah. they just got rid of the neuter, but Latin has neuter nouns. Interesting, though, it's not like all objects are neuter. Which is in French. Uh, no, in French no, no, French has, every object in French has a gender. Yeah, well, so and what's interesting is when you learn about gender in languages, as English speakers, when we learn about it, English native speakers, English doesn't have gender. We lost it sometime during the migration to... Except for, like, some a very few antique cases. Like what, he and she? No, blonde. The word blonde. If you're referring to a female blonde, it has an E on the end. But if you're referring to a male blonde, it has no E. Right. Wait, really? Yeah. That's a whole yeah. number from French. What? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, so when we learn about the gender, we tend to think, oh, it's male and female, so it's going to be stereotypical, you know, la mujer, el hombre, and then you separate stuff out. But, I mean, grammatical gender is not physical gender. You know, and often the things are assigned kind of at random. Um, does it give you learning the neuter case, for instance, in Latin? Does it give you a different perspective on uh, gender systems in languages? It does to a certain extent. The problem is that with Latin, it's not even... Like, not all objects are neuter, is the thing. Some objects have gender. Well, right. So, um... It changes a lot. Because <laughs> you have to consider a lot of things. Like the word for thing, for instance, is technically not neuter, but it's both masculine and feminine at the same time. So okay. it's it's there's a lot of words like that in Latin that have a lot of very ambiguous cases that to a native Roman probably would have made a lot more sense. Um, because there's just so much of the history of Rome built into their language. Which makes, I think, Latin very interesting. Because... Even though Latin, I will admit, it is a dead language. Very few people speak it. In the Pope any... tweets in Latin. He does. Wait, um, what? The Pope yep. tweets in Latin. Yes, when does he tweet in vulgar Latin or classical Latin? Vulgar. Latin. vulgar. Yeah, it's it's vulgar. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. The if you learn Latin in a Catholic church, it will be different than if you learn it in a different educational. Is it mutually intelligible? Yes. Okay. So a lot of the difference is in uh, how you pronounce words. Um, so the big example that is usually described is um, the word for peace. It's P-A-C-E-N. In Latin, there's no soft C, um, but how it's pronounced between the Catholic Church and the educational world is different. A C in ecclesiastical or in ecclesiastical Latin or vulgar Latin is like a C-H, so it's pacem. Um, but in classical Latin, it would be a hard K, so it'd be pacem. Um, there's, there's many other cases where there's differences in pronunciation, but that's usually the big one where people notice between pakem and pachem, because they don't sound the same. Okay. And I'm glad we got some nice pops for our... Uh, oh, yeah. No. <laughs> some good peas. Poppin' peas. Speaking of gender, I'd like to uh, bring up one of the more interesting aspects of Russian that I believe we, we discussed, at least on the group chat, earlier. Uh, and that is, Russian, like Latin, as you say, has three... Uh, genders, masculine, fender, uh, feminine, neuter, but it has four pronouns because in a, four pronoun types, because in addition to those three, it has a reflexive pronoun, which is used specifically to refer to the speaker, which is something that I, I don't know. I don't know a single other language that has such a feature. And you can tell me if any of your languages have such which a feature. feature. Wait, a so reflexive describe, well, yeah, describe reflexive how pronoun. This works. And I, I will describe how it works. Let me give you, for example, this sentence, which I posted in the group chat when we discussed this earlier. John burned with jealousy when he saw Steve kissing his wife. Right. So I'll ask you, is Steve kissing John's wife? Or is John jealous that Steve has a wife and he doesn't? Or that Steve's wife is hotter than his wife? This is something, so I, want, I, mean, this is something I wanted to bring up when we, when we were going to talk about uh, Irish. And so they, it uses, uh, I've only ever read this word, so I'm probably going to... No, hold on, answer it. the question first. It, is it, well, I think that S Steve was kissing John's wife. But um, this is something called, oh. I, I've only read this word, it's Dixis, D-E-I-X-I-S. And it 
is the linguistic term for you can for languages that use context clues to a situation mm-hmm. in order for you to actually understand what it's saying. So that sentence alone does not give you an idea of what is does not give you the exact like details of what's going on. But if it was surrounded by two other sentences that gave context or an actual physical situation it would allow you to figure it out. But something gives me a feeling that Russian does not use, or is not a didactic language. It gives you a specification for every single thing. That's interesting, and and probably is the case. I find that grammatically, it's much more specific than English is. Uh, It it does have more cases. uh, So what does Russian get? Uh, well, I'll tell you. What so, solution does the Russian give? in the sentence I gave you, the the problem is that the word "his" is um, ambiguous. is ambiguous. Yeah. It can refer either to John or to Steve. In Russian, you have the word instead "sibya," or in this case "svoy," which can be translated as "his own." Um, so, what off the table? <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm shaking the table. You may you may hear this in the recording. So in that case, you could either use the word um, svayajana, his own wife, to mean that uh, Steve is kissing his own wife, or you could use the word uh, yevojana, his wife, to mean the opposite. And in that case, it's specific. So the, so the former to describe his own wife and the latter to... to uh, so there's, or a the wife of the speaker. there's a distinction and, between the subject... Possessive and the, and the object possessive. Exactly. Okay. That's really interesting. That's I. Yeah, you're right. I can't think of another language that has that distinction. So in Indonesian, now that I think about it, it's a very gender neutral uh, language because, for example, boyfriend and girlfriend is just one word. It's pacha. It's hmm. like, although I mean, there are slangs for cewek or chol, which in itself means boy or girl. You know, gender neutral doesn't mean that the language can't describe a guy or a girl, right? Uh, anything, uh, anything, sorry, any object is neutral, uh, and any pronoun can be specific. Hold on, no. Uh, pronouns are also gender neutral. It's just dia. So whether it's William or whether it's a girl or I th- technically a person that is not male or female is also d- described as dia. Uh, the only... The only exception I can think of are specific, uh, but really uh, less used words. Like, male flight attendant is pramugara, and then uh, female uh, flight attendant is pramugari. And That's so, interesting. Yeah, and a f- female athlete is olaragawati, and a male athlete is an olaragawan. So, apart from... But there is no standard structure to these things. Usually, the female... Uh, the form of the word th- that denotes a female ends with an I sound, like an E sound. Pramugarawati. Pramugari, sorry. Pramugari and Olaragawati. But apart from that, there is no uh, gender... Uh, there is no gender specificity when it comes to uh, persons or even objects. And the and article, there's just one article too, one, one definite, one indefinite. Uh, article like the and a. The and a. Because so in yeah. a lot of yeah, I so think, it's, those so. aren't gender. Either. Like I have a question: how many how many genders does German have? Three. Okay, because Norwegian also has three, and I think female one is not used as. Or sorry, the neut- the neutered one is not used as often. I can only think of a. Uh, Couple uses of this. Most of the old German languages, which include Norse derived languages, German, Dutch, um, Afrikaans, y- yeah, have those three genders. Um, yeah. They get lost uh, in the English transition, um, in yeah. the isolation on the English island. I think that there is uh, one of the things that I think is interesting is uh, how some languages have adapted or uh, grown to be more progressive and inclusive as, you know, we move forward. And I think that I can speak that Norwegian has actually not. Like, anyone who is neither has Norwegian German. is Nordman, which is literally, nor- like, nor- like, from Norway, man. 
Like <laughs> northern, like if, uh, any girl from Norway is a Nordman. Any, uh, and I'm probably screwing up that pronunciation, but I think it's Nordman. And then multiple one are the Norwegians is Nordmenin, which I think is really funny. Uh, it's just a, a word. Yeah. But um, but does that include like adjective describing? Because like in, in French, if you were to describe the French men, it would be one. They would be the one masculine term. But you can use like say the French woman would be you know the femme française. No, which he, would be specifically he, feminine. So if I wanted to say a girl, what like the woman from Norway, I would say Kreenen fra Nordia. But if I wanted to say the Norwegian girl, I would say uh. Well, yeah, I would say Yenta uh, Nordman. Like the, so it's the same adjective. Yeah, regardless yeah it would be the girl Norwegian or and there's no just that Nordman is just Norwegian. They haven't like advanced to like just be from the, like just like an American does not give you like does not have like the word like man in it or anything like that. But no, like Nordman literally is just the man like the person from Norway man. And that's, like, how you describe someone from that Well, area. but then you really have to ask yourself, I mean, is that really an indication of how progressive a country is? Because Norway is, in a lot of ways, much more progressive Well, than he wasn't talking about the progressivity of the culture, though. Simply, it's language. Yeah, I was, like, I think it's well, interesting because, like, is, Norway, in, Norway has actually two languages. It has, um, it has bukmal, which it literally means book talk, um, and that's what everything is officially written in. And then it has something called Nynorsk, which literally translates to New Norwegian. New Norwegian. So, so there's one prescriptive? Like, they know from any organization that... No, so, so the, the, the way language. it works is after... So, uh, I guess we can transition to the history part and uh, on, on this. Uh, so Nor- Norway was for a long time uh, in a personal union, in a, in a uh, monarchy under the Danish. Uh, and so uh, a lot of Nor- a lot of Norwegian uh, sounds or derives from uh, Danish or has some, a lot of similarities to it. And because of that, um, you know, so, so they're very, they're very similar, but in the 19, uh, in the early 1900s, like 1901, 1902, there was a man that I forget his name who uh, wanted to see if he could construct uh, Norwegian, how it would have sounded had they never been inherited by the Danish. And so he came up with this new language called, or not new language, this new dialect called Nynorsk, which was an attempt to uh, construct the Norwegian language from the remote parts of uh, North Norgia, which is which is Upper Norway, um, to create a language that that probably would have that as close as possible that if the Norwegian language had continued to progress on its own, similar to how, how Swedish looks now, because they're mutually intelligible, but they are different enough to the point where Swedish kind of had its ability to progress on its own and, and Norway kind of, Nor- Norwegian had to be stuck underneath uh, Denmark. And so uh, the population in the west part of Norway, which is the least po- least populated part, they speak Nine Norse because this guy invented it and they, and they liked it and so they, it was very similar to theirs. And Oslo, the main populated part of Norway, they speak um, basically just Bukmal. So there are two different um, dialects of it. But that's one thing that I thought was interesting, like the point you brought up with Spanish is that there is a lot of uh, different dialects around the world. But in Norway alone, there are almost different languages, but they both, they all speak Norwegian as like a bukmal as a common, that's the official government language now. Um, Like Trondish is what's spoken in Trondheim. And it sounds alien compared to regular Norwegian. But they can all speak and were taught, you know, uh, standard book mall because there's a Nordic council and they all, you know, you know, work together trying to standardize the language. But Norway is so long and, and geographically isolated. Some parts are geographically isolated yeah. from the others that it makes it difficult for that, that there are many different dialects that are um, all throughout the country. And so I thought that was pretty interesting when you, when you brought that point up and how. Um, Norwegian when you're referring to it and so for, for me because I'm still trying to you know get into it and, and learn it and I'm uh, been switching between that and Spanish and there are actually more similarities than I thought there would be um, in terms of verbs but uh, and the, the form of verbs but they um, yeah when you learn it you're learning Bukmal but Nynorsk is like if you go into the western part of Norway like where you would vacation in the 
things like that, you're going to hear a very different type. It's called nine words, but the pronunciation is very different, and they use uh, almost different words. Yeah, and I think we should talk about then, following from that, the role of national language institutions in forming countries. You know, yeah, in forming one, well, in informing the direction of the language. Because Spanish, for instance, there is a royal institute. There is a royal language association in Spain, but they don't extend beyond, uh, really, they don't extend beyond the borders of Madrid. Um, you know, in Andalusia, they have their own particular dialect. Um, and obviously in Catalonia, they don't even speak Spanish. Um, and then Latin America is just, you know, they speak their own dialect, this very distinct dialect. Um, and you contrast that with a language like Germany, where the German National Language Association has a very strong hand in directing um, the nature of the language. Um, and I know for Spanish, a lot of the stuff I appreciate about Spanish, the diversity of dialect, the, ex the, the regional expressivity, um, is kind of uh, a product of there not being a strong language um, association. So, um, But then, you know, Norwegian... Apparently, they have a strong language um, council, kind of council, but it's so diverse in terms of yeah. uh, localities and how you speak. And um, also, changing gears a little bit, but still talking about the history of all of it, um, one thing that I, I read a, a great book that I'll plug called The Shortest History of Germany by James Hayes. It was very good, um, and it presented a, a very interesting thesis that we might talk about in another episode. Um, he was. He gave an example of the first time that actually German and French were used in a diplomatic case, and it was between Lothair or Lothair the second and uh, Louis the German or Ludwig, um, Ludwig or whatever how you pronounce that. And actually, uh, the guy there, oh, they had a secretary there who um, wrote it down, and it's the first time that. German was used as a diplomatic language. It was ever written down or recorded, and modern or uh, yeah, like modern German. It would not have been modern German. Old, it's too old. Old. It was 830 or something. Yeah, like it would that. have been just after the break of the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, and uh, French. The first time that French was used diplomatically, and what they had them do, which was I thought very interesting, was because um, they were brothers uh, fighting over their father's empire. Um, they had them read it to the opposite man's army. So they both said, we like, we will not fight anymore. And they, and so, uh, the, the general, the German general read it to the, the French and the French general read it to the Germans to show that they had actually, you know, united and, and come together. And that's the first time that, that those two languages were used diplomatically. And it's, uh, studied by linguists pretty often because that shows you, that shows like how the language has progressed. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to speak on Indonesian history here when it comes to, sorry, the Indonesian language history, because it's a very rich history. It's a very short one, though, and it's very critical for Indonesia as a nation that we understand the power of language, specifically our language, because uh, to begin with, the Dutch came over because what is today Indonesia were, was just a fragmentation of different kingdoms who didn't really care for each other. The mindset was, oh, uh, the Dutch finally took over that kingdom over there. It's fine. We don't really care about that kingdom uh, because we would be safe here. And so the Dutch were able to divide and conquer a, a, a region which has a couple of pretty, a couple of strong kingdoms because we weren't united by a single language, and we survived under the yoke of the Dutch for about three hundred years until uh, nineteen twenty-eight, uh, in which the youth, the Youth Pledge of Indonesia, which pledged that Indonesia should be united under one language. And so this was the first uh, attempt at unifying all of Indonesia uh, under one banner of Indonesia. Now, before we, ha we had a couple, uh, the Dutch had a couple ideas of unifying the entire nation or their colony at the time, not for independence purposes, but just so that it would be easier uh, to do so. But we don't really talk about that because uh, not only was it a spectacular failure, but it wasn't very practical. And so uh, the guy, uh, Van Hoysen, I'm going to try and pronounce it, uh, he wanted, he, he did create a system based off Malayu, but it wasn't very different from Malayu, and not a lot of people recognize it as our first rendition of Indonesian. But uh, 
Yeah, twenty eight was an important year for us because that was when we began to understand the importance of a language in unifying and creating a nation, uh, which of course at the time hadn't existed. Indonesia was not a thing at the time yet, but we did have a national identity without a border, and we even then we acknowledged that without a unifying language, uh, we wouldn't get very far. Now the Japanese also helped us with our language, uh, in a sense. Uh, I think a lot of scholars would uh, endorse the idea that the Japanese uh, used language as a as a uh, what is the term? Uh, basically, they they create they gave us a language so that when the when the Dutch came back, we would be more ready to uh, more ready to repel their attacks. Uh, scorched earth. It was like a scorched earth attempt because the Japanese knew they were going to lose the war and they had to retreat out of their Indonesian colony. And so they gave us the gift of a language, quote unquote. They helped us with a language. So that when the Dutch came back, and they did in 45, uh, we would be able to repel their attacks, which we didn't. The U.S. helped us help us out with that. Props to you guys. Uh, <laughs> but the importance of language shines here because uh, we were able to, for the first time in our history, come together and stand for an idea of Indonesia that up to this time had not yet really existed. Uh, through the, the power of a unifying language, even though Indonesia is comprised of um, the speakers of Indonesia also speak a lot of other languages. It's kind of hard to describe this, but there are a thousand two hundred some odd uh, different. Uh, well, there's the national language, and then there's the local dialects. Dialects, dialects of Creole. There are about a thousand two hundred of them under the wing of Indonesian. Um, and so it's still difficult to say, even if you come out with your formal Indonesian and you go out to like remote Sulawesi, you might not be able to get your way around. Um, and just speaking, uh, I think so, a lot of us have been talking about uh, the, the progression of language. Indonesian is a very, very young language, especially that it was first conceived in 28, or rather its formalization was under the Youth Pledge. Um, our last rendition or our last update of the of the language is in 2015, which is barely three years ago. We replaced a lot of different things, and I think the most interesting one is the use of a diphthong, which is um, like using two vowels to plug them together, like survey uh, with an ey. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't really have that in Indonesian until the newest rendition, in which survey is now spelled. Very similarly, it's S U R V E I, so it has a, a similar, more intuitive sound. So Indonesian derives then, I'm assuming, a lot of its phonological features from the native languages of the various islands. No, they yeah, just... didn't they, I think I read about this. Then they um, they were thinking about using the language primarily spoken on Jakarta. So that language is Malayu, basically. Yeah. It's Malayu. Uh, and there ha I think even at this stage, there was some romanization of Malayu because a lot of artifacts have, been, have uh, survived that show this. Um, but Indonesian itself is a completely new language. It's constructed, right? Constructed. Okay. To fit the demands of... It is the, se of the most time. successful constructed language. Yes. The other that, is, Hebrew. that is correct. But it's, because well, so, I mean, you mentioned Hebrew, but Hebrew... Was spoken clerically for thousands of years, right. but was and not a, a common Well, I'm glad language. you brought up the word constructed language, because there's some debate um, in... There's a, there's a constructed language community, and there's some debate whether languages like Hebrew and Indonesia, Indonesian, um, are constructed languages because... Uh, you know, Hebrew, what, there was stuff added to it, and it was updated, but ultimately there was a spoken language that it was based, it's a posteriori, right? It comes into existence following the already extant language. I mean, I, I wonder to what extent was Indonesia draw, Indonesian drawing from the already extant languages? I mean, I think a, a fair bit, but like, yeah, Indonesian exactly. is the most successful pure, constructed language. Yeah. Like, yes, it obviously can. I mean, words come from other words, but um, when you're making anything, but uh, with Indonesian, it is the 
most successful constructed language, and I think Hebrew is the most successful revitalized right. language. Revitalized? Was it dead? Yes, it was dead. It was well, clear. It, well, it would be like if it was the not Italians common. started speaking vulgar land again. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's um, uh, like, I, I think technically the, there are people who speak it, but... Well, I think one of the coolest things uh, in the or studied in languages are revitalized languages, and I think one thing... Uh, because of Irish? Well, not just of Irish. My, I'm actually, my particularly favorite one is Manx on the Isle of Man. I'm sorry, what was that place? It said Irish never technically died. You're right. But Irish, is still, Irish is still spoken natively at home by about 3 million people. Uh, in, and actually, it's growing because... Yeah. Um, there's actually a movement in the suburb, not the suburb, in the in uh, Dublin, in the neighborhood of Dublin, to restart it because apparently it has a very high information capacity and is very good at uh, for business and it's an so, efficient language. Yeah, it's an efficient language, and so there's a youth movement to revitalize Irish in Dublin. But the people in the in the Gale talk, um, which is far western Ireland that still speaks it the, the, that's where the three million people are they are we, they're like we don't understand it like we barely understand that they're speaking Irish let alone what, what the hell they're saying uh, so it's a very people, it's a very different dialect but it's still Irish and I don't know what accent it's based on there are three main Irish accents there's Munster uh, Dublin and I don't know I can't remember the last one um maybe we can yeah, I think you might be right. The, uh, the one of them recently died, and that was Ross Common. That uh, that was from Central Ireland. How did how did uh, these accents or accents in general? How did they form? So just uh, one thing that we were been skirting around is the concept of a dialect, because there is no linguistical definition of a right. language versus a dialect, right? Uh, which is something that is like the extreme really version I got over here, Latin. Developing into the Romance languages. What was the the famous quote? I think it was Bismarck who said that a language is a dialect with a navy. Yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is a good. Well, which is good to know there's the a philosophy. Of there's language. actually a debate right now going in the linguistical community of the United Kingdom about whether Scots is now like not not Scots Gaelic, not like Ulster Gaelic, right? But Scots, Scots English, yeah. is it a new? Is it Scots English or is it a new language? My opinion, Scots is a new language because it would be it would my group, opinion it is not because it would group together. With, it would be one of the only West Germanic languages. It would be Afrikaans, uh, English, and Scots it would be it would be the West German languages if that was true. And one of the things is that if you go to Scotland. I, when I was there, I could not understand the people from Glasgow. See, here's the thing, like, though. They, but there were people there from Glasgow who could understand that. But I could probably say the same thing about me going to Appalachia. And that's my concern. The only reason that I would say that Scots English is not a separate language is because there are regions of Austria that speak German that are mutually unintelligible to many Germans. But when written, and this is the key part, part so the, the thing, constitutive yeah. words are mutually intelligible. So the thing is, is that one of the big debates about it, and I can't remember, I think they're calling it Wallen, is like the, the mm -hmm. academic name for Scots now, um, to get rid of the, the ambiguity between that and Scots Gaelic. Um, so I think, yeah, it's called Wallen. Um, the problem with it, or in terms of like it being a dialect, is that they're now starting to spell their words drastically differently. And that's to the, the point where it might actually legitimately be becoming a new language. The, the problem is that as much as it's becoming its own language in Glasgow, more people are being born in, in Scotland that just are speaking plain old English, which was the problem, which is the problem with Irish as well. But Scotland, that's the other thing. It, it, Writing them down was only a case in point for the fact that the words remain the same words. Yeah. The spelling of a word had, actually has no effect, linguistically speaking, on it being a different language. Yeah, but the thing, the thing is, is that Norwegian and Swedish are considered two different languages. Norwegian and Danish are considered two different languages. And they are all mutually intelligible with each other. Well, yeah, but in the same way that Dutch and German and... Uh, Belgian and German are, to an extent, mutually intelligible. But I think that the the thing that would make Scots English a different language would be if you were to strip away the accent, would the sentences make sense to one another? So I'd say Scots is distinct. And this is hear me out. I'm going to say Scots, and and you can use this as a metaphor for other languages. Kind of use this as a as a um, 
as a kind of um, equivalency. Scots has begun to develop a distinct syntactical variety, which I think is... Well, then, in that case, I think we need to be discussing whether or not Cockney English is a separate language, and whether or not... So this, so, so this is, I brought this up because this is the problem with linguists and languages in general, is that, you know, generally when you have a language, people are like, yep, we have a language, we don't even consider it. But now when you try to scientifically add boundaries to what is a dialect and what is a language, it becomes very, very gray very quickly because of how many different dialects there are and uh, what they are derived from. When I, I mean, so I'll say that from going there and experiencing it, it is close to, I, I would consider it another language. Like, I could not talk to the locals of Glasgow and find my way around. I could not At go not to... not in their own... Uh, yeah, I, I could not go... I had, they had to speak slowly, and they had to change how they were talking completely. And then when I went to Aberdeen, it was the same situation, which is in, in north... Northern Scotland, well, Glasgow is kind of in the middle to the to the west. You know, Aberdeen is on the northwest corner, and they both they could understand each other because we had someone from Aberdeen with us and someone from Glasgow is in the hospital with us, um, and they could talk. And when we were listening to them, it was it, you couldn't so you could understand that, words. Well, so fair, like up, some of yeah. that. But you had you mentioned an instance that I would say would invalidate the, the possibility of it being a separate language, being that they could slow down. And they could change their pronunciation slightly. Well, well, now, wait a second, because that brings us to somewhere where we're talking about code switching. Yeah, but code switching remains within a language. Yeah, but, okay, switch. but, uh, okay, I can bring up, I think, a point to counteract that is in my group, there was someone who spoke, there were three people who spoke Spanish and one person who spoke Italian. Mm-hmm. Okay, when they slowed down and spoke, in the, they could completely understand each other between Italian and Spanish, but those are obviously two different languages. Same with Malayan. Well, and I'd like well to it depends, out. though. What, what subject were they discussing, though? And Geology. I think that's... Yeah. I don't think it's particularly right. useful to have an argument over what constitutes... Oh, I don't I don't think it's particularly um, useful. <laughs> I, I would just bring up about why I think languages are very interesting, you know, because yeah. there are so many different dialects and... Well, it's definitely not a hard and fast line. There are always gradients yeah. between languages. And at the end of the day, I would say there's almost more of a political and cultural line between how languages are typically divided um, as opposed to necessarily a syntactic or somehow scientifically well, distinct to, to or give, provide though. more context, or and I guess I should have, maybe should have started with this, is that one of the reasons that are having this discussion is because Scotland is considering independence again. and uh, So if they have their own language, I mean, that is a great political tool to oh, fuel, right. Right, which is what the Irish tried to do in the Troubles. Right. was, oh, hey, yeah. you're in Northern Ireland, you speak Irish, you should be with us. And also that, uh, you know, we were having a conversation this time about, about how big Germany should be. I mean, most of, as far as I, and I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of countries in Europe are have the borders they do because of the people there who speak those languages. Uh, is that one of the bases of Is that one of the is that one of the bases of Pan-Slavism? It's kind of actually well, the other way around. Right? It's more ethnic than than linguistic. I'd say Pan-Slavism. That said, the the modern form of Eurasianism, which is peddled by the current Russian regime, very much does use language as an excuse or as the basis, let's call it, of its sort of nationalism. Um, yeah, you know, they, I mean, the best example is what uh, what the president, our president, um, said recently that the that Crimea should be part of Russia because, Russia because everyone there speaks Russian. That is just the sort of attitude that's sorry. That's just the sort of uh, attitude that's it. That's an example of language being used as a political tool and how national identity, in this case Ukrainian identity, can or cannot be based on ex- ex- precisely on linguistic lines. The idea of basing the the idea that borders are based on language lines or ethnic lines is a very dangerous concept Absolutely. and very new. It's it's a lot newer than we give it credit. Right. Um, that concept really took international form following World War One. Um, well, and what, about the, the, the Balkan, what about the right? Balkan Wars with the Ottomans beforehand? That's less of a, that, so. That's an ethnic conflict to be sure, 
but it's not two countries time trying to decide on a diplomatic front regardless of war all right so this because we speak a language here the border goes here you keep saying you keep saying ethnic and maybe i just don't well so, it's so not true, but I think what isn't Frank one is of saying, the biggest things to you being a certain ethnicity is your language. No, no, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. There's a war between two ethnicities. That's one thing. But the idea of drawing borders in a diplomatic setting, in a setting that is exterior and to actually, a conflict. So here's here's a good here's a good way to think about why the Greek conflict pre World War One was not particularly ethno nationalist as we think of it now. Because, sure, there was a giant population of Greek people in Greece and in Macedonia, but there was also an incredibly large population of Greek people on the Ionian coast in Anatolia. But because of the political system in Anatolia, because of the way Greeks participated in the government of the Ottoman Empire in Anatolia, they didn't participate in the Balkan Wars of Independence against the Ottomans. And so... It wasn't so much an ethno-nationalist war, although certainly that was one of the reasons given for the rebels. It was a political war where Greece was... There were vanishingly small numbers of Ottoman Turks in Greece proper, but in the Anatolian coast, there was a... There was a so, so, you're, so you're saying that it language is, is kind of used as a national... is kind of used as a political tool to... You know, rebel, to get political and to, ends. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that it's incredibly selective because both the two different sides can claim that they have a dominant language um, in an area. We can look at Alsace Lorraine. Sure, yeah. Many people there speak German, definitely. Many people there also speak French. So. Well, I mean, you know, if we're going by linguistic nationalism, which we certainly shouldn't, as we've discussed, Belgium should probably be part of France if you're following well, the southern well, half. To be yeah. fair, partitionism is not like a fringe position in Belgium these days. Right. Um, well it, it really yeah. isn't. There is a large calling in Belgium to do splitting, but the other the other side of the coin so that is equally lose the parts of French that make sense. The Belgians <laughs> don't yeah. speak French correctly. <laughs> so if you flip um, this coin though, there's another equally dangerous side to this political decision Which of is shatter Europe. Uh, well no. No. Yeah, well, well that's also dangerous. Yeah. That is shut up. That is not what I'm talking about. <laughs> the best. What I'm talking about is uh, linguistic cleansing. Um, oh, yeah. After the borders were redrawn after World War II, yeah. um, a lot of Germans were uh, were essentially forced not to speak German or to leave. Um, and Poland, that was specifically. in Poland, in the Kaliningrad. Russian Kaliningrad, yeah. in the Czech Republic, um, which I'm not trying to attribute blame or guilt to anybody, but that happens in all sorts of places. Franco's attempt to repri- repress Castilian, Catalan. Catalan. No, I can see. He sorry, Catalan. sorry, to repress <laughs> Catalan. Yeah. Um, the idea that even in America we attempted to repress um, the use of native languages to yeah. or Chinese redraw. and the Chinese Indonesian community under Suharto. Even now, yeah. the idea that the Chinese might begin to legally repress the use of Cantonese on Hong Kong to yeah. just to mm-hmm. get rid of that potential border distinction. Irish in Northern Ireland. Right. So the idea that we can draw borders based on linguistic distribution is rather rough because it, it justifies both um, rebellion based on attempted linguistic distinction and the cleansing of languages within your borders right. to stabilize your own nation. Um, well, and I know there are reasons to rebel, right? but uh, I don't think language is a great one. Um, it's a little too, it's too fluid. It's something that you can change with a national policy, and that's dangerous. That's why you should have prescriptive languages, right? Proscriptive, no. right? No? No fist bump from the French guy? Um, right. I, I don't think that, I, I can go through the examples of why I think French prescriptivism is dumb. I actually have a list here. Hang on. Uh, okay, <laughs> what is that? But so, oh, yeah. so, yeah. so, so yeah. for our listeners, kind of institution. Yeah, for so our listeners, the, well... The, well, yeah, no, prescriptivism is basically this is a way that a language ought to be spoken. Oh, so like a language council, like a language council, yeah, or, and or academy, or, like, okay. or okay, okay. Well, it, it, it describes institutions that quote unquote govern language. So, like a proscriptivist thing is like the Academy Francaise. This is how Frank. French should be spoken. Or just the German government. Or yes. the German government. <laughs> or, 
but then you have things like you know dictionaries in English. They're descriptivist because they say this is how uh, ling- this is how English is spoken. We're not going right. to make anything on like if this is correct. This and that's is just not always how, it how it's been. No, no the first true. dictionaries were prescriptivist. Which was um, actually pretty useful. Which I'm was honest. useful at the time because there were so many different methods of spelling English words. Because that, came from so many and I think this is also a decent case in point. It almost appeared that English was separate languages across the British Isles. Right. That um, they were mutually unintelligible unless you slowed down and you stopped spelling things differently. Um, and um, an example in America, which we don't have a language institution. Mm-hmm. There's no governing body in the U.S., but there's an informal governing body where use of, for instance, African-American vernacular English or uh, Appalachian English or even, in some cases, Southern English. I know the Tidewater accent. Spanglish. Um, yeah. Well, those are all stigmatized in the professional world to a certain extent. And that's a kind of informal prescriptivism. Mm-hmm. Um and also in the educational yeah. world, just the idea yeah. that you teach a certain grammar structure in mm-hmm. English, and that you are, even if you aren't explicitly teaching that structure, you're correcting your students when they deviate from it. But that's right. only to make yourself useful, right? Because no, so no one outside... That's, that's, that's a big another, argument. I think there's going to no be a big argument people. in the States very soon of, especially in the Southwest, when I was in Texas, that, that there were signs that, you know, like they're having meetings about this, what, like... Um, should our public schools all be teaching English in English? Sorry, in English, because yeah. most, not most, but a lot of the Southwest and Texas, they have a huge population that speaks Spanish. So while it is the duty of you know the public schools to inform them, instruct them on English, so that they can be successful if they were to move anywhere in the United States, the or South, South, or wherever yeah, they, they could speak English. Does it not make sense to better educate them in their native language, considering it's only one big other language? Well, and the reverse is also true. Doesn't it make sense to have it be mandatory for the rest of us to learn Spanish? Because well, it's I mean, looking like it's going to become increasingly practical. No, I, I, I yeah. completely agree, and I wish that I had paid more attention when I was in, you know, six through... 10th grade to spend. I mean, I can get around, but not well. I would like to have, like, even more conversational in right. it. And the college does not offer Spanish at 9 in the morning, unfortunately. <laughs> so I don't want to it. Um, or any other time than 10. Um, but, um, well, what, where I was going with that is, like, if you look at the 1880s, one of the things that allowed um, the immigration po- immigrant populations that were coming from Germany, Ireland, Russia, uh, being a very big one of them, was that they all learned English. Should they then learn English? Or should we enact those same policies to yourself? To enroll to uh, both ourselves and learning Spanish, but also to those Spanish immigrants, uh, those Latin American immigrants in the southern section of the United States. Well, so here's the deal. There is a real, there's a sliding scale here that has been there is a sliding scale here that has been a fixture of debate across just centuries of uh, of usefulness versus cultural preservation. Um, it would be extremely utilitarian if all across the world tomorrow um, we changed all of our educational systems to speak German or, or Spanglish. <laughs> anything. Yeah. Literally anything. Man, man Spanglish. We could all switch to Esperanto <laughs> that right mean? now. Cool. Um, and if we did that, economic... Co- I mean, we would we would save millions, if not billions, if not trillions of dollars in international commerce because we'd no longer have to deal with the errors that come from translational issues. Yes, the flip side is you lose... Some, but we would almost certainly also immediately within two or three generations, again, assuming this ridiculous plan can be pulled off, um, lose a ton of cultural distinction. And how much do we place value in that? What does that matter to us? One of the things I think that is pretty interesting is uh, if you look at migrants and generations after the initial, after the first generation to arrive in America, um, which of those generations speak the, their, you know, their native tongue? And so they've done studies, and what they found out is that first generation 
struggles with English, and still speaks their, their native language at home. Second generation uh, doesn't really know the language, um, doesn't really know the native language, or it, it, like the parents attempt to make sure that they don't speak it at home because they want their kids to learn English and be successful. Mm-hmm. And then the third generation almost doesn't know, knows almost no words of the native tongue. But then something interesting happens where the fourth generation, they actually encourage the use of that native tongue because they want to reconnect with those older generations. So the third generation is sort of SOL on their native tongue, yeah. but the fourth generation is almost always encouraged to learn the original language, which I think is very interesting that once you learn it in the at least in America. Once you learn English, then we want you to learn your original native language. Oh, there's no way. That, that is literally me with Chinese. When, I was going to say, can it, confirm when as it well. Comes, <laughs> when it comes to my uh, my Chinese roots, that mm-hmm. is literally me. Because under Suharto, uh, which is one of, one of Indonesia's uh, dictators. big dictators, uh, was he a good dictator? Economically good. Dictator? Economically good. Everything else... Kind of bad. Uh, he repressed the Chinese language. So my parents don't know any Chinese. And I'm the one that's uh, given the responsibility of reconnecting with my roots. Which is why I'm taking Chinese in this college in America as a Chinese in Indonesian. Which is kind of ironic. And kind of sad. The first time I showed up to class, they were like, are you sure you can't speak Chinese and you're not faking it? Pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> and then you said that's the same thing I'm missing with yeah. Italian. Yeah, with Italian. So my... My grandfather's father on my mother's side, but definitely my grandmother, uh, were fluent in Italian. My grandfather forbade it, though, to be spoken in my mother's house. Yep. So the third generation mother, loses yeah, it. Yeah, my mother does does not know really any Italian other than a few words that she heard my great-aunt Laura say, because she was also fluent. But I only know one word. Based upon the Sarno, <laughs> not the Sarno. It was actually Piccolo because uh, that was what my grandmother called me whenever I did something stupid. I had no <laughs> idea what it meant. It's really a shorthand for Piccolo idiota, which just means little idiot. So maybe it means little. Yes. Well, I you know that at that time. Yeah. Um, one thing. One thing that I thought was interesting. This is uh, when I was with the Italian dude in Scotland. Uh, he cooked for us every night, and it was incredible. Um, yeah, but he was Milanese. But he, he, he's from Milan, yeah, and he hated the South with a burning passion. Yeah, um, he uh, went off on because how, they speak a different language. How ragu is a specific meal in Italy. Like ragu it is. is a specific. I, I can make it. It's delicious. It's very simple. But here we just think it means sauce. Like, ragu <laughs> sauce. Like, there's a whole brand yeah. around this one meal that Americans are like, oh, I don't know what ragu means. I'm sure it means something saucy or something like that. No, it's just one specific meal. And so is a bolognese. Mm. Here are just meatballs and pasta. Yeah, and like meat. spaghetti bolognese. Like, oh, whatever. <laughs> but no, it's a specific, like, with, like, actually, and carbonara is the same deal. Like, they all have very... You know, Specific uh, instructions. No milk, no carbonara, no cream either. Oh, eggs. eggs. Um, eggs. Yeah, but so. actually, using Italy as an example, just because I know a little bit about Italy. Use, when we look on the outside, like Nazis some, Nazis part two. Italy. What? <laughs> the fascists uh, taken had, over. Yeah, they just had their election. Not good. Well, uh, yeah, no, I know that. But yeah, the populace came to power. But we're but, not talking <laughs> about politics this episode. <laughs> but um, with Italian, it's interesting because the Italian language is just the Italian, uh, it's just the language of northern Italy that has now been applied to the entire country. Um, because in the south, for instance, they don't, they speak Italian. Most of them under, know Italian. But many of them also speak Neapolitan. And if they say, oh, you're Italians, they'll be like, yeah, but you know, really at the end of the day, I'm Neapolitan. No, so, I'm or, or, yeah, I'm Sicilian. Uh, the Sicilians and Southern Italians, like south of Naples, tend to get along pretty well because they were both part of the kingdom of the two Sicilies, and everybody seems to remember that as the good old days. Victoria, um, too. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that's just an interesting example where they say they don't even speak Italian. It's like, well, because they don't, because Italian isn't actually a real language. It doesn't apply to the entire peninsula. Ouch. Well, it is a real language, but it, it should be called something else because Italian does not stem from the entire peninsula. Meanwhile, all of Germany speaks German. 
I mean, this that would be very true. useful. So listen, but, there are two reasons why that's true. The first is that all of the conflict areas where we likely would have had friction about where German is, you know, spoken, like, do I actually speak Poland German, now. are now part of other countries. So, except for Bavaria. Except for Bavaria. But even then, Bavarians really are decently mutually intelligible. Um, Wait, is, I'm sorry. Is Bavarian German different from regular German? It's oh, a, yes. A, no, it really is. They sound like hips. They, they, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> well, so, so, I, so, I, so I was told by uh, my friend from Switzerland that he speaks Swiss German. And he That's was like, different. And he, that is way and he was like, different. yeah, we can understand the Germans, but the Germans hate us because they don't understand us. Agreed. And that is because... Swiss German contains all of the worst parts of French, i.e. the mispronunciation of literally everything. <laughs> um, but that's just the three-second rant for today. Um, no, but like all of Germany, so again, it was made easier by the fact that all of the places that could have been contested, German-speaking areas, people that could have contested were it. hacked off from the country. Um, were hacked off from their lives. But also, uh, <laughs> Jesus. the other thing that they that Germany has done with their prescriptivism, which I think ties back to a lot of what we've been saying, um, instead of being prescriptivist to a hostile level, um, Germany was very tactful. They said um, in the 70s and then again in the 90s when East Germany joined back on and they revamped the language again to be somewhat more inclusive, um, what they create is just sort of a national baseline. That's what you're taught if you want to be a news broadcaster. That's what you're taught if you want to appear on TV or be a politician. Basically, it's the language that is propagated. It's like Atlantic English in the uh, 40s. Exactly. But in no way is it forced the upon Atlantic, you. The Mid-Atlantic accent. Yeah. But because it's not forced or hostile, nobody looks at the prescriptivist German as being evil or somehow cultural destroying. Because all it is is what's taught to the masses. Someone from the French Academy would slap me in the wrist if I said something wrong. But and that's the point. The 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 French Academy continues to get rather hostile. The German Academy does not really care. But the reason that they don't care is because it's actually more productive. If well, it's also that the the German account, like the German version, is actually taught in schools. While the Academy Francaise is respected, it's increasingly not taught. In well, schools. so it's taught in schools, but that's mainly because the German government has a decent grip over the educational system. Um, oh, you said that fast. I kind of want to go away from that topic. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but uh, the the other key aspect is that the Germans realized very early on that if kids are listening to radio, watching TV, going to school. It doesn't really matter all that much what their families speak at home. Eventually, if they want to talk to one another, because the other thing about Germany is that it's a very fluid business economy. If you want to move from southern Germany to Hamburg and, and do business, that's doable. Um, that, that they would, on their own, decide to learn the prescriptivist German, and that's why it's propagated so quickly. Very weird people. Um, I think the same thing yeah, you said yeah, about yeah, yeah, My professor was German. He was just a strange. He was from uh, Frankfurt. That's a good time. Beautiful. So, Joe, you haven't spoken in a while. You want to speak on any more uh, yeah, about Joe, Russian? Uh, you really want to do this episode. Did you have something you wanted to bring up other than that sentence about John's wife? That's well, as far as uh, prescriptivism goes... Um, <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. Power through, power through. <laughs> the, to the best of my knowledge, Russia does not have the same sort of... Uh, of academy of language, or at least does not have the same control over the language. Um, well, they can barely get their populace to stop drinking. And they got them. Oh, let's not resort to. <laughs> I think the um, the thing about Russian, which places it different from French and German in this regard, um, at least in in the modern age, is that it is used as sort of a link of a ling, lingua franca. Lingua lingua franca. franca. Lingua franca in a country which is very much more still an empire in the old sense than France remains or that Germany ever was. Um, in that. Probably um, about 10 years, yeah. Um, there are still many different ethnic groups uh, within Russia that use Russian to communicate with the outside world. But even outside of Russia, in much of the former Soviet Union, Russian is still used as um, as, as as a way to conduct day-to-day business. 
Um, for instance, there was recently a conference in Uzbekistan called the C5 plus one conference. And what it is, is it's a meeting of the five Central Asian states plus the United States to talk about areas of mutual concern. And despite the fact that Russian is not the primary language of any of those countries, Russian was the language that that conference was, uh, conducted. was conducted in because it's still, uh, a common language there. Something that the United States could uh, perhaps change if they were willing to conduct more international business. Well, Use English, dude. And, well, that's the thing in Central in Central Asia, in particular, and across much of the former Soviet sphere. Actually, there's an effort to move away from that. Um, move away from English. Move away from Russian. Okay. So specifically in uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, there's been attempts to reform their native languages, Kazakh and Uzbek, away from the Cyrillic alphabet in which they were first Kazakhstan. alphabetized, codified, however you want to put it, into a Latin alphabet. Now, the, um, but that's been slow going simply because it's so deeply ingrained. And that that brings up actually, I think, some parallels with Spanish, especially in Unisur. Um, where you, almost all of the countries in Latin America, with the very notable exception of Brazil and the French uh, in South America. America. Oh, you said Latin America. Oh, well, yes, okay. Belize, to, well... So Guyana, Belize, they Belize, speak more Hindi than they speak any European language. Belize may not be a part of Latin America, sorry, sorry depending not. on your conception of Latin America. Yeah, it is not. Um, Suriname, they speak Hindi. Latin America is a cultural concept. There's French, uh, Guinea, French Guinea, Guinea. Um, which Guinea. apparently is a, you know, an integral part of France. Yeah, it's now. a sovereign portion yes. of the nation of France. Well, okay, so it's ridiculous. Okay, so France, right. France has been that way ever since it became the Third Republic. Yeah, they cough up. <laughs> they basically right. said that all parts of the French Empire were France, and as such. Then. All right, all right so just, anyway, just to put the my point, just put the Indonesian claim into Africa. A lot of Madagascar people are Indonesian. Um, Indonesian deception. My point is, in Unisur, the group which governs South America, you have the notable exception of Brazil, the only important exception, really, if we're being honest, um, who speak Portuguese, which is not mutually intelligible with Spanish. Unless you speak very slowly (laughs) and on very basic topics, as with Italian. Um, So, the Lingua Franca is naturally Spanish, because that's what most people speak there. Um, But there's a kind of... There's been a movement in recent years to reintegrate, uh, for instance, Quechua um, and Simche, um, and a lot of these native languages, which, as it turns out... So so for a long time, it was believed that these native languages were dying, um, just hiding. They're hiding mm-hmm. in the mountains. They were hiding, yeah. And in Peru, for instance, now, oh my God. there is... Cusco. Right. Uh, what, what, what's the, it starts with a Q. What, what is the actual... Quechua. Q-U-E-C-H-E-A. Q-U-E-C-H-E-A. No, U-E-A. Yeah, um, something like that. Or U-A. Um, but Quechua. Yeah, Quechua. I, I, I had a friend who went to Peru uh, for the whole summer doing charity work, and he said that by the end of it, he had to be... He was pretty fluent in Spanish, and then he knew a lot of because Quechua because it's in right. the mountains. Because as it turns out, a lot of people in the 1900s and in the 1800s lied to the government and told them that they only spoke Spanish. And so there is this sudden resurgence in native languages, not just in Peru, but in a lot of countries, <clears throat> um, where Spanish is suddenly, in a lot of areas, no longer the majority language. Well, Quechua is the largest... I, mean, I remember reading it. It was the... It is the largest... By population spoken Native American language. Yes. And it is one of the only ones last, left that has the opportunity of being the lingua franca. A national anywhere. language, yeah. yeah. And I, um, Peru is the. the Peru is. I love Peru. Peru, Peru and Chile, they have huge populations of, the, of these, you know, but do they, do they speak, language pockets. Do they also speak Spanish, too? Well, yes. Yeah. Sure. Yes, most people, most of them speak Spanish, but, and I'll tell you, I hiked the Inca Trail and our guides were mostly Quechua. They spoke Quechua and Spanish as their second language. And their Spanish is very different. Um, it, it's very, it's yeah. intelligible, but it's very different. Um, 25, see, that, that's so interesting because in, in, in Indonesia, in all of Indonesia, I dare say, uh, Indonesian or the Indonesian language is still, 
uh, spoken from Jakarta, the capital city, all the way to like the edges of Papua, which I've been to this summer. Like, and even you know in what? the most remote villages. And you know what I think it is? Is Indonesian has a national identity, a national framework of the Indonesian government. Whereas Spanish, as soon as the Spanish Empire dissolved, Spanish fragmented immediately um, and continues to do so to this day. Yeah, Argentina is Argentine and Spanish is very different. Chilean Spanish is actually like if you want the most vanilla Spanish, it is not Spain; it is Chile. Oh, they no, Spain speak, has weird Spanish. Yeah, no, no, Chile like the Spanish. How does that even teach, work? The Spanish they teach you in high school is Chilean Spanish. Well, it's it like is, how British English is like just it's it's it's, it's not, weird. Yeah, yeah if you, but isn't isn't British spelling of English just out is less famous than than uh, American English because well, so the way you think about it is the way English. we think about English accents I mean, as being like best. upper crust, you know, the standard Tory Washington. accent. Right. Um, similarly, that's how um, most Spanish speakers think of Castellano, the one that famously has a list. Is it's a very metropolitan bougie? About three yeah, minutes left. That um, anyway, that's all I have to say about Spanish. I just think it's very interesting. The contrast between Indonesian and Spanish spoken in South America. Mm-hmm. I think there. I think that the you know, languages are uh, louder, Ryan. You're not getting picked up. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Well, you can't hear my language being spoken right now. Um, <laughs> I think that you know languages are I, one of the most interesting things to study. I am just terrible at learning them. I think I can. I can if I hear Spanish. I know what you're talking about. I just have trouble responding and, and speaking it, and so. It's interesting that you guys feel like that you can hear languages and know what you say, but you can't actually respond back. We should go around and... It's like uh, Chewbacca with understanding English, but not being able to speak anything. I was like, how the hell can you do that? We should like go around and just say one funny or significant tidbit about your language that you haven't like, spoken about in this entire episode. Just funsies. A fun fact. Yeah, fun fact. Uh, German. I can Irish German. is one of the only... Uh, Languages that has the grammar structure of verb, subject, object. That is interesting. It's horrible. I'm going to go this way, that way. Well, Joe's thinking, so we're going to go to William. Okay. Well, with uh, with French, I guess the the annoying part that people always have is that French doesn't pronounce many of its consonants, or they tend to allied, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, allied together with other words. Um, this renders French to be very flowy, but this is not to say that those words, especially on the ends of words, don't disappear. They kind of become like ghost letters, so they influence the sound before them. And you can hear them if you're very, if you're very, very concentrated and very listening for them. And a a Frenchman will hear them all the time. They will know exactly what you're saying. I'm not a Frenchman though, so it's very challenging for me. Um, I'm trying to think if there's another fun fact for French. Um, I guess with Latin, what's fun is that Latin is Latin does have a very strong language structure, um, but the way that it was spoken and the way that it was written were probably different because the way that we know how Latin was probably spoken was writings from uh, or Germans, actually, who wrote in Latin, but they wrote what they heard, not what they were never educated like a proper Roman. So the, the example that's usually used is in Latin, when you want to say something in, I think the past participle, you would like say like he has said. It, you would say something like dictum est. Two separate words, distinctly different. But Romans wouldn't say dictum est. They would say dictums. They would just ally them together. And German authors would write dictums, not knowing that that's just not even correct. And so that's huh. how we know how it was probably said rather than how it was like actually spelled. Because we have all the correct spellings, but those are gone now. Or the, but the, all the old ways to say it are probably gone. I think all the fun facts I've already mentioned in the podcast, like, for example, it was a constructed language, it was a political weapon, uh, roots in colonialism, that sort of thing. So I'll end with a funny note. Indonesians uh, like to make portmanteaus of their... Of Is that how you say that word? Portmanteau. It's only ever seen it written. <laughs> it's like maca- ma- macabre, macabre. 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 Yep, no, you have to have to yeah. say that one. So we like to mush big things together. For example, names of institutions. We would mush them together to form a nice, uh, nice word that would, you know, uh, re- refer to this institution. It's funny because some of them go, uh, they have a comedic, uh, or they're just funny. Like for example, we have 
the bar ice cream, which sounds like ice cream bar. And indeed, ice cream in Indonesian is ice cream, and bar is bar. So it looks, it sounds like you are referring to an ice cream bar, which you go out with your friends and you know you go to Rita's or whatever, and you have a nice cone or something in the middle of the midday sun. But it actually, me, it, it actually refers to the Bureau of. Uh, Intelligence. The Bureau of Intelligence of Indonesia <laughs> is called the Bar Eskrim, which is basically um, a way to, I don't know, make, make light fun of the institution, I think. Could you imagine, um, like, slipping a meme into a national language? Like, you know, like, like, a, like a Easter egg in a game, like, but a national language? That'd be so cool. I guess my fun fact about German would be that in, in ever, in irrepressible animal urge among the population to increase efficiency. Um, the most recent two generations of German are Germans are swiftly killing a case, um, an entire uh, case of German. Um, the, it was, oh, the, the, the possessive. Yeah. It's called the genitive. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't exist in English. And it in Spanish. Um, the, German, the, the youngest two German generations, so I guess what would technically be in the U.S., the Millennials um, and the Gen Z, Z um, are almost never using it, uh, much as their parents used it less. So um, how are they able to so get rid of it? When they, just, they have bypassed it. Um, in English, I guess the closest we would get, they don't. So we would say uh, that's James's chair. In German, there's a way of saying... That is the chair of that belongs to James uh, yes. with a different case. Um, instead, they're just going. That is the chair of James. Um, they have they have used their equivalent of the word of, and they have begun to apply it to literally everything. So grammatically incorrect, but no, grammatically correct. correct. It's just it would in previous years have been considered far too formal, um, but now it is becoming the baseline. Because and what does that replace? What does that replace? It's the genitive case. It is an entire case of German. It doesn't. It doesn't exist. Anymore. There is no. If there's like there's that. no proxy in English. It would. Yeah. It would be. Um, <laughs> it, it, the closest it would be the chair, the, the Blake. It would be uh, the the chair, the the leather, the chair. It would be. It, there's a way of saying that in German that says the leather of the chair. But instead, they the just closest gone, thing we have is the possessive. Exactly. We don't have an equivalent in English. But as English has deemed it inefficient, so the Germans have done. Does Spanish have one then? And they have begun cutting it wholesale. We, probably English like from daily wrong. conversation. Spanish probably like to to make make something formal is too informal. So by the time that all of us are forty, the, the language may have totally cut an entire case. Well, that's what happened though. Simply out of uselessness. Yes. English way back in the day it was because English had a, a formal register and an informal register. Yeah, yeah that would be the next thing to go. Almost certainly, though, in German. Well, thou. No, that was was yeah. That that was informal. It was cut from English Register, yeah. where everybody yeah. just decided to be formal. I like how I sang used the BSs. And all right. Um, my fun, my fun factoid for Spanish um is going to just be that um in almost all Spanish speaking countries, the bus is el autobús. Um, very yeah. very boring. It's a practical. It's a it's a borrowing from. English, actually. Um, but in certain regions of Central America, it is actually La Guagua, and it is much more fun to say. <laughs> wow. Um, There's a La Guagua. G-U-A, G-U-A. Puerto Rico is like the only country, but the only area that uses a different word for trash can. Yes. I don't remember what is. it is. But I, mean, yes. but I, I remember growing up or learning it. Uh, my Spanish was from. Puerto Rico, so she taught us this word, and I used it, and then, like, I was talking to someone in Spanish from somewhere else, like, back in high school, and they were like, what, what is that word? Yeah. Is it Safacan by any chance? I only know the formal what Spanish, is the formal? which is La Basura, yeah, the trash. trash. Yeah. I think, oh, the trash. it is Safacan, yeah. This um, this is a Spanish fun fact from the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic also use, uh, uses Safacan. Okay. And the way that it was explained to me, I don't know if this is true or apocryphal, another word I've only seen spelled, but the uh, but that it had something to do with English-speaking sailors, that it was something, some can, there, there's some naval term 
Um, yeah. I don't know if that's true or not, so somebody should look that up. Well, the Dominican Republic has its own interesting... The Dominican Republic is one of the Spanish-speaking places that's in, integrated the most African mm-hmm. um, words into it. And there are all sorts of fun things. Um, las, uh, uh, zafa, which means um, to, to ward off a curse, a thing that wards off a curse. And fuku, which is a curse that comes to you for a specific reason. It's not a curse someone places on you, but it's a curse that is... It's almost karmic. Yeah, but it, but it also has these very... But it's, it's all derived from these, like, um, African influences, because the Dominican Republic, you yeah, know, um, right. with Haiti right there, has a lot of African influences, much as during the 70s and 80s they tried to purge the purge all of them. I just like yeah. the word character. Yeah. Not going yet. What the hell? Uh, what the... So, fun facts. Wow. Uh, number one, in Russian, 90% of the time the word order literally does not matter. Um, so like it, Latin? Kind of? No, Latin word order does matter. But uh, if you're reading poetry, it doesn't matter it doesn't, because poetry makes no sense. While there are conventions, primarily in Russian word order is used to... Um, to emphasize which part of the, which aspect of the sentence is most, most important, quote unquote. So for it's example, the same deal with that. yeah. So if, if w- whatever word answers the question, quote unquote, is at the end of the word, uh, at the end of the sentence. At the end? So you gotta wait for the guy to say whatever he wants to say and then get your answer. Russians are masters of suspense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that why, well, well, they are they is that why Dustin their masters books are of huge? Things. Yeah. Drink. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're a um, ger- the Germans also drink heavily. Yeah, they are. And they drink alcoholics. they drink freaking wheat beer and it's awful. They're alcoholics. Well, you uh, gotta be Asian. The alcoholic rate in Germany is far lower. <laughs> That's why you should go with rice wine. Wine. <laughs> had that, that once at a money conference. Potatoes. Did not enjoy it. <laughs> Just <laughs> everything from potatoes. No, no. Uh, and so would you and sake is. I'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Um, <laughs> the second have a drunk episode at some point. You should. You definitely should. I, I think I'll that ask. violates you, you guys. No. <laughs> we'll have to record it here. Um, our own drunk no, history yeah. podcast would be great. The second perhaps interesting thing is that when talking about completed actions, uh, there is no future tense. Uh, Russian has a, Russian verbs have a distinction between perfective form and imperfective form, disp- depending on whether you say you've completed the action. So, for example, there's a, a funny phrase that uh, uh, so the word dielats means to do, and it essentially means uh, I did a lot today but got nothing done. Mm. So if you want to say that you will do something and finish it in the future, you use the present tense of the perfective. I don't know why. It's just one. So of I can't things. say uh, I'll do my homework and I'll finish it tomorrow. Like that, right? That uh, you yes, you would. You would say it, it would be understood as future tense, but it is. It would be the present tense of the perfective is understood as future. So I'll just say I. I do my homework. Well, I mean, there's not really a literal translation. I guess the that literal sense the literal the translation of every word would be: I am getting my homework done tomorrow. See, I am getting my homework done, present, understood as future. Okay. Huh. Hmm. All right, everyone, thank you for listening to no our fun language episode. I just okay. said that Irish has a verb subject where... Um, okay. okay, my fun fact about Norwegian is that um, you almost never in Bookmall pronounce the T at the end of the word. Uh, unless it's a verb, and, but almost all adjectives you don't pronounce the T unless, like, you're... Uh, unless you are trying to emphasize like like it's really serious what you're trying to tell them. Like uh like if you're like being strict or like you're uh correcting a child or whatever. So our favorite uh Swedish indie band, if they were instead from Norway would have been pronounced Pokar Torge. It's only at the end of the sentence. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, it's only at the end of the sentence. So it's at the end of the sentence. Yeah. Yes. Pokar Torge. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how uh I guess that's my favorite. and uh there are like eight different ways to say little for some reason. Okay. 
I was supposed to represent Chinese, and I kind of got lost with Indonesian and all that. But I'll end with a Chinese, a Chinese language fun fact, uh, because it's a picti- pictograph, a uh, picture based language. Right? I think that's that's how I mean, you way back that's how you describe way, it. Way back, yeah. yeah but... um, so they have a lot of like characters, right? So for example, if you uh, there's a character for a tree, right? And if you put two characters together, uh, two trees together, quote unquote, it becomes a small forest. And if you put three, one on top and two on the side, it becomes like a rainforest. Now, the fun fact is, a similar concept appears for the character girl. So one girl, uh, you know, represents girl. But if you put three together, that word means noisy. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. All right. I thought that was funny. And thank you for (laughs) listening to this episode of Talking Twops. Disclaimer is that... Wow, this is an editorial board, and our opinions are not the opinions of the College of William and Mary. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to reach out to podcasting at wm.edu to start your own. Or if you have anyone who's interested, let them know, and uh, we can get co- and they can get in contact with us at that email. My name is Ryan Walter. This has been an episode of Talking Twomps, and have a good day. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Adios. Complete